Hello and welcome to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast with me, Errol Lawson, where three times a week we bring you inspirational interviews with some of the world's most influential Christian leaders from church-based leadership, business and academia. Now, before we go to today's interview, I've got a question for you. Do you have a coach? You see, the greatest sportsmen, athletes and every single one of the leaders I've interviewed on this podcast have all had coaches to improve their performance and help them get better results. Now, the number one distinction that I've found from interviewing all these leaders, the top level leaders, and between those and the emerging leaders, is not that they're more qualified necessarily or they've got more contacts or a better background. The number one distinction is that top level leaders are clearer about who they are, where they're going, and what they need to do to get there. Clarity makes all the difference. Now listen, if you're looking to go to your next level and you're looking for a coach right now, I want you to contact me today to book a free 30 minute coaching session where I'll help you to get clarity in an area of your leadership or personal life that you're looking for right now. Simply email me at errol at errolawson.com today with a subject ready to get started and we'll get you booked straight in. Enjoy today's podcast. Hello and welcome to the podcast today. And thank you for joining us with me today. I have Pastor Phil Pye. Phil Pye is the central area leader for the Assemblies of God in Great Britain and the UK. He's also on the senior leadership team of Arena Church in Ilkeston and Mansfield. Phil, um, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. And um, Phil, first of all, if you will, just give us a, a bit of a um, any gaps in that bio, there's lots that you're doing right now. Give us a bit of an update on what you're doing right now and just fill in any gaps in your bio, if you will, please, Phil. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, great to be with Errol today and... Uh, and to see what God's doing in him. Uh, I've been married to Sharon for uh, over 36 years, and we have two grown-up daughters, Miriam, uh, who lived in Australia for six years, but now lives in Manchester, married to Johnny, and Alison, who's a primary school teacher in the inner city of Nottingham, and she's married to Ryan. And just recently, I became a grandfather for the first time. (laughs) Congratulations. Um, So Miriam (laughs) had a little baby girl just over four weeks ago, Charlotte, and uh, we're really blessed by that. Mm. Um, yeah, we uh, love being on the repurposing journey of Assemblies of God with John Partington. We've got some great leaders in the central area, uh, uh, representing over 100 churches. Uh, we've got some great young leaders emerging, Errol being one. And it's a real joy to be in this season. And uh, we thank God for it. Yeah, so um, things are good. It's been a landmark year for me because uh, I've preached at 60, but hopefully still with a little bit of energy and future in front. And uh, we've had a really blessed year. Awesome, awesome. And Phil, where did your leadership journey begin? Um, were you born? Were you born and raised in church? Were yeah. your parents Christian? How did you? How did it start for you? Yeah, I mean, briefly, uh, Errol, when I. Um, hear about people planting churches nowadays I'm always inspired because as I trace back into my own journey uh, my grandma um, post the Second World War moved from Lancashire to Nottingham with my granddad um, to find work because the cotton industry was um, receding in that part of the world and uh, in the early 50s uh, somebody planted a church in one of the suburbs of Nottingham uh, and my grandma got wonderfully born again And when I say she got saved, she got saved. Mm -hmm. It was a radical conversion. And so she became a catalyst for faith. Uh, It was all now into three and four generations, certainly not all the family of believers. Um, But she prayed, and she was very open about sharing her faith. And that had an impact upon me. And so um, uh, I gave my life to to Jesus um, as as an 11-year-old boy. Clearly, there's been many fresh response to that but my leadership journey in essence began with a sense of a real call to ministry Errol uh, in a significant season of my life when I was 18, 19 What was happening there in that moment? You know, what happened was that um, in the Pentecostal church that I went to which had, uh, was the one that had been planted um, there was a, just a 
what can only be described as a move of God amongst the young people. Interestingly, it didn't really touch Sunday. Um, but for about 18 months, uh, the youth services, as they were in another era, of course, uh, were marked by a, a, a very deep sense of God's presence, a lot of worship, uh, a lot of prayer, a lot of um, the dealing of God with people's hearts. And all I can say is that out of that season, um, I'd be about 18 and a half, 19. I knew, I just knew, I knew, I knew that God had called me to the Christian ministry. Wow. Wow. And so you answered the call? And yeah. When did you, you've been in the ministry a while now. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I try and encourage uh, young men and women sometimes because I think what happens sometimes is that God sometimes really breaks in deeply to people. Mm. Uh, it may be a, a summer camp, it may be a special celebration, it may be a response to the pastor's message on a Sunday. And sometimes they think they've got to make an immediate response to that, um, almost a little panicky that how they feel will go away. But I encourage people just to take a little bit more time with it because the call only gets stronger, mm. the burden only gets deeper, wow. the conviction only you know, gets uh, more striking. So I was at work, uh, I worked for a large textile company in Nottingham, uh, and I was on a journey of production management. And so there was really about a three-year period between that season and then I, went, and then I, I left work and went to Barber College. Mm. Um, again, I'm not saying everybody's got to go to Barber College, but it was absolutely right for me. Mm. I, I, mean, I, you know, I went to Mattersea, which is the Assemblies of God Barber College, mm. and I just knew I needed to be there. Um, and it was less academic in its structure than what it is now. Mm. Um, there for two years, and it really, really, really did help me. Mm. So I just encourage, uh, particularly young people, that trying to sense the call of God over their life. Mm. If you really feel God's done something in you, mm. just, uh, just allow God to continually build mm. it. Mm. and then make decisions from mm. there. Awesome. And was there like a turning point for you in your leadership journey where maybe you were you were going in one direction and whether it was a, a an encounter with God or an event that happened that caused you to maybe go in a different direction? Uh, for, for me, uh, and I've spoken to colleagues about this, so mm. once I came out of um, uh, mm. Barber College, I, I got married and a week later I was running a church. I was 24. Wow. And... Um, uh, I think at that time, if I could, the, the only way I can describe it, Errol, is that perhaps the emphasis was a little bit more on the minister than the leader. That said, I realised by God's grace that I was leading, and I gave a strong lead. And um, there were some there were some real difficulties in the church that had been historically, and over a period of time they t they changed and turned. So I think for me, it's not been a, a striking moment, but I've realised over the journey of ministry that I've also had to continually develop my leadership and I'm still doing that mm. I'm encouraging other people to be leaders but I'm only doing that on the basis of continually uh, and deliberately and consistently allowing my own leadership mm. journey to continue to be shaped mm -hmm. What's been your biggest challenge so far in leadership? Um, so I think the the biggest personal challenge I think is my confidence in my leadership mm. um, so just in terms of my temperament sometimes I can um, I can lack a little bit of self confidence mm. and I use that word advice and I'm not talking about overconfidence mm. so I've really had to um, increasingly come to a sense of confidence about my lead and what you know I'm called to be I think a little bit of that perhaps is background come from a very ordinary back, background mm. you know grew up and the second eldest of seven children grew up on a council estate in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. And sometimes lids can come on you that try and define you. Mm -hmm. The reality is that, you know, God's just been amazing to mm -hmm. take hold of me and use me, you know. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, without doubt, the greatest challenge in Christian ministry as a leader is discipleship. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't have any sense of having to think twice about that. How do we get people from making a commitment to follow Jesus mm. to become fully devoted followers? Mm. And, of course, over those 30-odd years, life, society has become more complex, uh, more divided, mm. um, all sorts of morality issues, you know, that people are having to work through. 
Um, so very, very, almost invariably when people make a response to follow Jesus, they, they're often very, very broken. Mm. And I just think the continual challenge is how we get people from brokenness mm. to wholeness mm. without it. Uh, and to do that perhaps in their... Uh, in a more rapid way so they, mm. they find freedom they find mm. liberty um, and they come to a place of being fully devoted in their Christian faith Are you seriously fired up about developing leaders and growing your church to the next level? Could you do with someone to help you get some extra clarity or to be a sounding board for your plans and ideas? Great athletes have coaches so do great leaders the right leadership coach for you will result in increasing your performance and dramatically increase the results you achieve. Errol is an experienced leadership coach, award-winning author, an entrepreneur, and pastor. He has interviewed over 60 of the most influential Christian leaders from around the world for the Rising Generation Leadership podcast and uses his unique insights, leadership experience, and his passion for the gospel to coach Christian leaders and help them to discover the clarity, confidence, and competence they are looking for. If you're ready to go to the next level, leverage Errol's experience and extensive network of contacts to help grow your ministry or support you in your personal and professional development. To experience the power and benefit of Errol's coaching, Contact us now to arrange a free 30-minute strategy session that will help you to understand exactly what your next step needs to be. Email admin at erillawson.com right now to schedule your call. You know, as you speak, you know, there's this sense of um, a father's heart that God's given you as a leader and just spending time with you as well, you know, just there's a sense of um, a depth of, of heart and an ability to discern as well. Um, I know there's people listening who may be on, on their own leadership journey. How does somebody, how does someone cultivate that heart attitude, that mindset um, towards life, others, people? Yeah, I, I just, I just think it. So, I just think it's out of continually committing yourself mm. um, to to process, to allowing God to shape you, to grow you, mm. um, and. Um, I mean, thank you for that, Errol, because I do feel in this season that one of the things that uh, God wants to pour out of my life is, uh, in that sense, to be a father to others. Mm. And sometimes that be, that's a very close relationship with mm. people. And sometimes it's more of a just cheering people on mm. that I come across periodically. Mm. Um, and in terms of the work you're doing, you'll be very conscious that... Mm. Uh, in a natural sense, we live in a very fatherless generation. Mm. And I do feel that um, prevailing churches do need people that will carry, you know, a positive father spirit mm. into people that will draw people to them. Mm. Um, so I think it's it's just it's just continually committing mm. over, a, you know, a period of time to let God shape you, develop you, deepen you. Mm. Um, we don't have time today, but you know mm. where I'm at today has often come out of obscurity. Mm. Um, it's come out of pain, mm. you know. It's come out of sacrifice. Mm. Um, it's come out of giving away. Mm. You know, all the all the gospel discipleship principles that mm. we often push back on. But if we will give ourselves to it, mm. you know, God's continually shaping us, and something be then increasingly begins to pour out of us to others. Mm. And um, at this stage in your journey, how do you define success? Yeah. I, I thought about this, and and I think um, it, it's a, forgive it, me if it's a slightly cliched answer, but mm. for me, success is defined by faithfulness. Mm. Um, and clearly, we want uh, we want people to succeed. So it may be a leader in business, mm. entrepreneur. We want them to grow a great business. It may be a leader in church. Mm. We want them to grow a great prevailing church, which in, includes increasing numbers. Mm. It may be a, a great a teacher. We want them to have, you know, and so it goes on. Mm. So. I'm not against people being successful, mm. um, but for me, the danger is sometimes that uh, success gets defined by shallow values mm. um, that are quite transitory. Mm. And and I'm just reminded of the story Jesus told when you know he invested in people. Two two of the people used the investment. One hid it away, and mm. you know at the end he said, "Well done, good and faithful servant." Mm. Um, so I think uh, I define success as being faithful to my core um, um, uh, including my 
um, barber college training very nearly 40 years into that journey and clearly there's been some ups and downs and some difficulties but I'm I, you know and I mentioned 60 you know but I am very pumped still about mm. living this call and being mm. faithful to it um, I think also um, I'm faithful I've been faithful to my covenant so I've been married for 37 years I said I will mm. and obviously we've got many fractured relationships now and sharing and me feeling a just a natural sense we want to be a good role model to people so you can have a long term you know uh, lifetime covenant that um, that works mm. and and I think I've been faithful um, in my commitment to be a father both naturally um, so I've got a good relationship with my daughters but as you said also I, I do I do feel that part of my life's journey at the moment is to is is just to be a good spiritual dad to people as well mm. and I want to be faithful to that mm. um, so yeah that's that's really mm. where I see success I want to be you know in the right sense of the word I we in mm. terms of arena the central area mm. the repurposing of Sam's God yes we want to be successful mm. um, but I think the bottom line of that is by being faithful mm. that's great man. And I think John Maxwell said that success is defined um, by your daily routine. What does the first 90 minutes of your day typically, I bet it changes after yeah, sure. What does it typically look like? Yeah, well, I think, number one, having a rhythm to life. So, you know, mm. so not lying in bed, mm. you know, on a regular basis and wasting time. So a rhythm to life, a rhythm oh. to getting up at a, an appropriate time. Mm. And and uh, so for me, I, I, I'm normally going to bed 11-ish I'm rising 6.30ish. Um, there's context in terms of where we need to get to in terms of, if you like, our place of work. But in those first 90 minutes, there would be a time spent with God mm. and, and a time uh, in his word. So I, am, I, I plan that, my, my daily readings. Okay. For example, two years ago, I read through the Bible in a year. And it was more of a challenge than I thought, mm. but I've not done it for a long time. Mm. Last year and this year, I pulled right back and I've been going more slow. So I've just completed the Gospel of Mark, mm. um, but moreover, a few verses and ruminating on them. Mm. Uh, I keep a, uh, a notebook, a, a journal, if you like, of uh, impressions from my Bible devotion, and I sometimes use a commentary to help me, mm. um, and I can reflect back on that. So I think mm. people have to um, have different approaches, but there's, there's nothing like just spending some time with the Lord mm. and um, spending some time in his word and I try most of those first 90 minutes of the day mm. to find room for that mm. sometimes it gets compromised mm. and I've learnt over the years not to spend the rest of the day in guilt because mm. God knows our hearts yeah, yeah. but I don't want to go too long mm. um, without an expression of my personal devotion to mm. him and are there any other key habits that you've had to sort of adapt into your into your life in order for you to have been so faithful and four, four key habits yeah. I think for me Errol because I think one of my primary calls has been to be a, if you like a, a minister of the word you know mm. God um, uh, graced me with a you know teaching preaching gift and so for me four things number one praying mm -hmm. okay. number two reading um, so leaders are readers mm -hmm. um and I'd like to read more, but it worries me when I say to lead when I say to leaders, so what book are you reading at the moment? And they don't got an answer. Yeah. There's always gonna be something on the go, even if it's even if you've got stuck on it or there's mm. gotta got be something that you're into. Mm. Um so praying, reading, preparing, always having a sense of preparing for you know, having food. Mm. Uh, if you like the old fashioned word of putting something in the pantry or the larder or if you like in modern day terms, some food in the deep freeze ready mm. to take out and give to people. Mm. And the fourth thing I think is collating. So listening to the real world, taking all the things that are appropriate in being a good communicator. And that's helped me. Uh, four things that I do on a regular basis. How did you collate? Um, filing, okay. writing down, recording things on my no, you know, uh, iPad, tablet, notes. But things that spark me, things that I think that could work, things that are um, of the everyday language, um, things in terms of famous people, you know, and sometimes you, you've got an immediate 
idea of where that would work, but sometimes it's just worth noting down. Mm. And it allows you, I think, to keep ministry fresh, mm. relevant to people. Mm. So they're, they're four key habits mm. to my life, mm. you know. You tell a lot of stories in your, in your preaching. Yeah. Uh, where do you get your stories from? Yeah, exactly that, collating. I mean, I try not to overdo the stories, you know, because, uh, you know, it, uh, but but certainly on occasions, um, the power of a good illustration. Mm. And it's amazing, sometimes you, you've jotted something down, you're preparing, it was six months ago or so, and you, if you know where to go for it, mm. people have different, uh, you know, I, I write a lot down in my journal. Mm. Um, I'll also sometimes keep cuttings or put stuff on my iPad notes, mm. you know, you create leaders create particularly leaders that want to be communicators mm. you know creating your own resource system mm. um, and it, allow, it I think it allows it's you good. to have a resource that keeps it fresh that's good and um, what's been your biggest uh, what, what is your biggest weakness as a leader yeah I think it goes back to what I said earlier mm. in the sense that that I think I think I'm a lot better with it now but I think earlier in ministry and in the journey of being a leader it would have been that sense of inferiority Mm. You know, um, and if you're not careful, you end up comparing yourself with others. Mm. Which, and I've I've come to I've come to, I, I really so if your leaders are listening to this, I really encourage you not to live by comparison. Mm. You know, you're uniquely made, uh, you're uniquely blessed, and you've got to find your own identity. That's why I think sometimes leaders get insecure because mm. you know it, they're living by comparison, mm. and uh, that little accusing voice inside will always say well you're not as good as him you're not as good as mm. her mm. so I think that was a journey for me mm. um, interestingly as well and I think a lot of leaders deal with this shyness mm. um, so it's always something of an irony mm. that God's called me to stand in front of people for 35 years um, whereas if you spoke to my wife that would know me mess that's my natural temperament it is to be quite shy you know mm. but one of Learned to do over the years by God's grace is to press through on that. Mm. So it's not become a, a prison for me. Mm. You know, I, I, I speak to lots and lots of people every week and relate to them in all sorts of ways. We're doing one on one now, mm. um, but all sorts of different ways. I often go into contexts where um, there's um, there's no relationship, you know, where you're breaking open new relationships. Mm. Um, I'm standing in front of people on a regular basis. I'm going to. So, a lot of it is people, you know, majority of what I do is people connected. So I've learned to press through that over the years. Mm. And sometimes when, I, like in this context of this interview, where you're vulnerably sharing a little bit to yourself, mm. sometimes people are a little bit surprised because they see the public um, persona, yeah, yeah, well, you know, yeah. of the you know the leader, mm. the communicator. Mm. And, but... But it is true, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I think about less so in term, but it is definitely part of my temperament. Mm, yeah. But I think earlier in ministry, I perhaps wrestle with inferiority a little bit more than I would have liked. Mm. I'm in a far better place with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your biggest strength? My biggest strength is, I think, consistency. Mm. Um, I was listening to um, just the back end of Sir Alex Ferguson's interview on leadership on the BBC a few weeks ago. I just got the last five, eight minutes, mm. and right at the end, uh, the interviewer said to him, so Sir Alex, what's your greatest, what would you define in one word as your greatest strength? I'm not copying that, but yeah. it was fascinating to say that he said consistency. Mm. Um, so his ability to keep producing winning teams, mm. um, his work ethic, his turning up when things went well, and his turning up when things went bad. Mm. So I think for me, and I'm always a little bit loath to talk about myself, but I think if you spoke to people that know me well, mm. um, they would say it's my, my consistency approach to life, mm. to every day, uh, to my ministry calling, to mm. my preparation, to my delivery, mm. um, to my temperament. You know, I don't want to be somebody that's up and down. I don't want people to come towards me and think, what moods are you going to be in today? So even in mm. terms of moods and temperament, mm. being consistent, it's we great. clearly all have our off days. Yeah. But generally speaking, I think that would be my major strength. That's great, man. That's great. And um, significant mentors in your life. Who have been your, your, your top top two or three most significant mentors? Yeah, I think um, I think I realise, Errol, that there are, there are seasons in life when people impact. Mm. So if I trace it right back, my first significant mentor, I wanted to use the word at the time, mm. but when I'm, when I'm talking about mentorship, for me it's about influence. It's about... Mm. 
example. It's about people that pull me on further than where I am. So my first mentor would have been my youth leader back in my church that I talked about earlier. His name's Tony. And I've spoke to him personally since and honoured him. And they've also honoured him publicly. Um, but he was a listening ear. He was a great, he was a very godly example. He pulled something of a commitment out of me that was very deep, mm. um, that set me up for the journey. Um, Dr. David Petz at Mattersy mm. and several of the teaching staff, they were very influential. Mm. And then I've tended to, on the journey of ministry, maybe be drawn to people in little periods of time. Mm. Um, and then some of the well-known Christian leaders of the last mm. 20 years, Bill Ibels would have been, you know, mm. at a distance, of course. Mm. I love his passion, but also his humility, mm. and he's a great leader, mm. um, and others. So it's it's been a seasonal thing for mm. me, and I look back, and I've tried to honour people mm. uh, as I've walked back. People have come into my world, mm. and the only way I can describe it in terms of mentoring for me, have drawn something out of me. Mm. Um, John Partington, interestingly, he never used the word mention, but he's certainly drawn something out of me that he saw in me that was bigger than what I saw. And, um, you know, I thank him for that. Um, so that's how he's tended to work for me over the years. Let me dig a little bit deeper into those relationships. So you, Dave Pets and your youth pastor in particular, and perhaps John Partington as well. What's the most significant bit of advice that each of those people have given you? Uh, I think... Um, the first one, Tony, yeah. was quite a serious type of guy, still is, mm. you know, been very, very successful in business. Mm. I think for Tony, it was, it, it was, it was establishing a foundation in my life where God came first. Mm. And um, uh, during that move of God that I talked about, God dug very deep in my life, you know, my priorities. Mm. Uh, I always enjoyed sport, but certainly at that time, it would have come before anything. Mm. And out of that season, it's never, never, Come before anything again. Mm -hmm. So Tony would have done that. I think David Pets. It was two things. It was a love for the Word, and a love for the work of the Holy Spirit in in life. And for John, I think it is is that whole sense of um, finding the fullness of life. You know, he loves John ten ten in the Bible. And if you don't know it, if you're listening. You know, the thief wants to steal and to kill and destroy, but I'm come that you might have life and have it in all of its forms. So I think John's inspired me increasingly to embrace the fullness of what God's got for us all. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. And um, so lastly, Phil, tell us what is it you're, what you're most fired up about right now? Yeah, well, I'm, um, I think um, I really, I'm really thankful that I sort of sense I'm in the, uh, the real bullseye of, of what I ought to be doing. In fact, I almost sort of laugh at myself sometimes in terms of really, really being thankful that I really am doing what I'm meant to be doing, um, which is very stretching at times and very challenging. Um, but I've got a grace for it, and um, so it carries me forward. I think in terms of my responsibilities in the area, I want to continually, you know, see a repositioning of, of every one of our churches finding a you know, a great relationship, and if they need to find it outside of themselves to help them become all that they're intended to be, to do that. And all of our leaders, and it's a it's a heady ambition and desire, but all of our leaders to find the absolute destiny of God for their lives. But as I said at the beginning, we've got some great leaders, and we we understand sometimes some huge challenges, but everybody to prevail. And I think for me, it's the power of encouragement in that to keep sowing in to keep believing, to keep cheering people on, to keep helping them find connections and um, and to see some significant uh, shifts and changes within communities around the central area. And um, I think the, the final thing really to leaders is just is just to, again, it, it's a well-worn phrase, but to seize the day. You know, the, the, the quote from Dead Poet Society, the film Carpe Diem. But I do think that most leaders underestimate what can be achieved in a day. I'm not on about people getting frazzled, burnt out, depleted, but I'm on about making a day count. Right. Um, and I think too much time gets wasted at times. And there's all sorts of things that seek to distract us. By intentionality, by consistency, by good planning, I, I think there's a lot more in most leaders. And so my desire is to make my days count. And my prayer would be for every leader 
that you make your days count mm -hmm. and that everyone listening, everyone on a journey of leadership, be it at the beginning or well advanced, would uh, would find the bullseye for their life. Awesome. Phil, cool. thank you so much for your time today, man. And uh, is there anywhere we can find out about you? Is there, um, do you have a, a Twitter handle even? Or? Yeah, at philippi1 on mm -hmm. Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if people want to access the Arena Church website, they'll find more there. Brilliant. And there's podcast ministry, etc. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Phil. God bless you. Thank you again for joining us today on the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast. I pray you've been inspired, you've been lifted, you've been encouraged to take your personal leadership to the next level. We really encourage you guys to just take action, make it happen, do something, start somewhere, go out and change the world in some way, big or small. Guys, if you've enjoyed the podcast today, please share with your friends, share with your loved ones, your colleagues, someone out there you think might benefit from hearing this great content. And uh, if you want some more questions answering, you got a question, email me, errol at errollawson.com. Or if you want a free 30 to 45 minute coaching session with myself around a leadership challenge or issue you're working on in your business, your church, or in your organization, please feel free to email me right away or get your booked in. It's errol at errollawson.com. Thank you again for listening. Go to our iTunes page, check it out, check out the previous episodes. Give us a nice review. That would be awesome. Really appreciate if you could do that for us. We really appreciate you just for being here and listening. Thank you so much. God bless you. And we'll see you on the next episode of The Rising Generation.